on this edition of Independent Sources, immigrant backlash. Are immigrant voters still on board with President Obama, or will they jump ship in the upcoming general election? Donor deficit. Growing concern that ethnic donors to nonprofit organizations may not be able to fill the gap left by the aging white counterparts. And Asian sensation. A Japanese independent filmmaker leaves home and unearths a gold mine of culture treasure in the United States. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. And I'm Viano Ravinka. During the 2008 election, the chants of Si Se Puede rang out like a war cry over a battlefield. Many Hispanic and other immigrants felt assured that a president of color would surely bring about the immigration reform that has flickered in and out of reality over the last few years. But four years later, that change has not come. The president recently owned up to his failings and said that his inability to pass a comprehensive immigration reform bill has been his biggest failure. But he's admitting to that failure enough to bring immigrant supporters back to his campaign. I spoke with Michelle Fay of the Immigrant Defense Project and Jared Murphy of City Limits magazine about the president's chances of wooing immigrant voters and the possibility of them supporting his opposition this time around. Jared, how strong is disappointment among ethnic communities on the president's failure to address immigration or implement immigration reform within these four, four years of his presidency? Well, it's hard to say because I think you know, things have changed recently. Obviously, the executive order that uh, the president issued earlier this summer uh, changed the landscape somewhat. So there obviously was a very palpable sense of disappointment before that. You're um, talking about a deferred action program? That's correct, yes. Um, you know, Obama, obviously, when he came into office, people uh, greeted him with a great deal of hope that he would address immigration. Um, there were certainly steps along the way challenging Arizona's law was, I think, seen as a, uh, a pro-immigrant move. Uh, but at the same time, Obama's number of deportations and removals was higher than, I think, any president before him. So I think the, the uh, change to the uh, Deferred Action Program this summer changed the landscape somewhat. But then last week we learned that uh, the Health Care Act was not going to apply to people covered by that. So I think it's sort of still finding its way. The question, I guess, is, you know, in America's electoral system, it's not a question of who the perfect person is, but whether they're better than the other guy. And I'm assuming that uh, that's still a fairly easy choice for most immigrant voters. Michelle, do you find that uh, the Deferred Action Program um, with the tens of thousands of immigrant, young immigrant people being able to apply for legal status. Did that help a bit, or what's the mood generally across the board of uh, eth ethnic communities? I think most immigrant communities definitely at least appreciate that President Obama has taken this token measure to um, not at not create a path to citizenship or even legalization for young uh, people who came into this country, um, but that it's still a move that doesn't address the real issues. We have immigration policies that are highly outdated. We have deportation numbers that are skyrocketing, um, that as Jared had said, President Obama has deported more immigrants than President Bush had. We've had over one million um, deportations in the past four years. And what we really need is for President Obama to take real leadership about these issues. So I think it's unfortunate that many voters feel like they are stuck between a rock and a hard place or that they have to choose between two evils. Um, the one that they know, which is President Obama, who has failed to deliver on the majority of his promises, and the, um, the one that they don't know, which is Governor Romney, but who has made every indication that he's not going to be a strong leader on uh, issues that matter to a lot of our ethnic communities. What are the sentiments uh, on the fact that this uh, policy came so late into the presidency and so close to the next election? I'm not sure how that's perceived. I'm, I'm assuming that some people probably think it's somewhat opportunistic. Um, it, you know, I think Obama's case is that uh, he attempted to take a uh, maybe make a broader reform uh, going through Congress, and that the Republican-led Congress was not receptive to that. Um, that's 
probably true to some degree. I think other people who question how much political capital the president invested in that attempt. Um, and obviously the question is what changes after November, assuming Obama is reelected and assuming Congress more or less stays in the same hands it is now. I don't know if the prospects during the second term are any brighter. It seems like for a while there's been a consensus among, if not a majority, a, a substantial section of Americans that something reasonable has to be done about immigration, um, providing a path to citizenship, or rectifying some of the problems that we've been talking about. Uh, but it just doesn't seem to have been able to get through to the crucial you know, sort of swing votes within Congress. And I don't know if November changes that. Obama was quoted recently in the uh, Latino media saying that uh, his inability to, uh, to pass immigration reform was his biggest failure, to quote his words. What are some of the reactions to his admission, Michel Fay? I think it's true that this has been a huge failure and that immigrant communities across the country have really expected something more from President Obama. It's definitely true that he's not the only one that has to shoulder responsibility for the failure of real immigration reform and that he is dealing with a Congress that's very difficult. Um, but I think the kinds of immigration reform that our immigrant communities are looking for is also not what had been laid out on the table in the past few years, even before Obama came into office. So, for example, the most recent versions of comprehensive immigration reform, if you can call it that, really ramped up deportation still, um, was very enforcement focused, and still had at its, uh, at its center uh, legalization for very few and deportation for the vast majority of others. And so I think what we really need is for President Obama, if he stays in office, to really deliver on immigration reform that's going to be meaningful because past versions of immigration reform proposals have failed not only because of difficulties with Republicans in Congress, but also because they were not able to garner as much support as they needed from immigrant communities themselves. And uh, Jared, you mentioned that the prospects uh, are not that bright for immigration reform to happen in, in a possible second term. How much confidence is there um, in the communities uh, on President Obama delivering if he gets a second chance? I don't think there's very much confidence, I think. As Michelle said, it's, there have been so many uh, you know, past failures and, and really episodes where the commitment of political leaders to this cause has really come into question. I would assume there's not very much confidence uh, at all. I think that um, the Deferred Action Program, uh, you know, if you were optimistic, you'd see it as a step towards something better, uh, but more likely is that it's uh, sort of something that's going to have to tie people over for a number of years until something else in the political climate changes to be a little more welcoming to, as you say, something that really approaches comprehensive and humane immigration reform. I think we're pretty far from that uh, on both the politics and the policy now. We can bring up the famous uh, phrase, it's the economy, stupid, and assume that this will, too, apply to this um, election. I'm wondering, if, is this appointment on immigration so strong, with some folks at least, that, they would, uh, that it would affect voting turnout? Well, I think all of these issues are very connected, right? Um, immigrants obviously are key to us having a healthy economy. Um, then at the same time, you know, their ability to stay here then is a central part of whether or not we're able to recover from the financial crisis, uh, crisis that our country has been facing. So um, I think President Obama has a lot of work cut out for him, but there are also immediate steps that he can take at this point. For example, the deferred action for childhood arrivals, the, what we used to call and what many of us still call the dreamers, um, that is a good first step. But there's still more that President Obama can do, and including on his own. For example, the deportation programs, such as secure communities, that have really contributed to you know, um, the million, over one million deportations in the past few years. President Obama can stop that today with just by signing um, just by signing a termination of this program. And until he actually takes steps to try to stop these deportations and to lift this cloud of um, terror of deportation from our immigrant communities, it's very hard for us to expect immigrants to really be able to focus on you know, all the other aspects of their lives that would benefit all of us. Jared, what about the uh, mainstream media's coverage of uh, 
of uh, the immigration issues? Uh, are they uh, getting the, the right picture of, on, on, on what's, what's, what's happening within the communities? I don't think so. I think they missed two things. I think broadly speaking, they missed the level of frustration um, that's there. Uh, that's a common mistake. And I think the second thing, too, is to treat the immigrant community as a monolith. It's obviously not. Um, it includes people who've been here for many years, people who are here recently, uh, folks who are naturalized citizens but immigrated, and people who are not. And, you know, in speaking to um, immigrants and immigrant reporters myself, um, you know, frequently we tend to think of immigration as the only issue that those voters are concerned about. And it does tie into other issues, but I know that, you know, there are people from Nigeria who are concerned about some of the World Bank IMF policies that Obama is associated with, uh, folks from Poland who are worried about Obama's decisions on the missile shield. So the thing to remember about this very complex issue is that for voters, they face this and other complex issues. Um, and that immigrant voters are a force in some states, but not so much in others. So how much they will have a role in the election, how much influence they have to wield, um, you know, it's a complex matrix, and I don't know if we'll be able to discern that even after the votes are in come November. Michelle Fay and Jared Murphy, thank you both for being in studio with us today. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Still to come on Independent Sources, what is the demographic donor cliff, and how will that affect the future of nonprofits? Before that, Marlene Peralta has some other news. Thanks, Vianora. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic and community media. El Diario La Prensa highlights alarming details about a group of Mexican women who are victims of human trafficking and have been forced into prostitution in New York City. The Sex Workers Project told El Diario that they currently have 50 open cases of survivors who have told their stories. The women have a lot in common. They were brought from Tlaxcala, Mexico, and most worked in Queens. 54% reported being physically and sexually abused, and 69% of them met her trafficker through a family member, neighbor, or friend. From the forward, a group of activists want to ban Iranian companies involving the country's nuclear program from connecting to the Internet. The bipartisan group is called United Against Nuclear Iran. The group wants Internet companies to deny sanctioned entities such as government-operated companies, banks, and even some universities the right to connect to the Internet. Although the message has appealed to some international Internet providers, they have not been responsive. The activists say that if these sanctioned entities lose access to the Internet, it will be harder for them to do business. Voices of New York examines the new interactive map put together by the Center for Urban Research at the CUNY Graduate Center, which uses the 2012 redistricting plan. The new districts show that a large number of people are not able to vote. For example, in Senate District 13 and District 33 in the Bronx, less than half of the population is eligible to vote. That's because most adults in these areas are non-citizens, and there is a large population under the age of 18. In other areas, like the redistricted State Senate District 16, the vast majority of voters are white, although its population is 53 percent Asian American. The Office of the Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Police Department has its first black woman inspector. Kim Royster is a 27-year veteran of the NYPD who started working as a police administrative aide in 1985. Inspector Royster is now the new chief liaison between the police department and the media. That from the New York Amsterdam News. And finally, Korea Daily reports that there is a unique school in New Jersey that teaches culture on Korean language to Korean adoptees and their parents. The Angel School registered 10 families for its fall semester that ends in December. The classes include K-pop, Korean cuisine, and balloon craft. The school was created by the Asian Women's Christian Association based in Teaneck, New Jersey in 2003. Those were just a few headlines from the ethnic and community media. Back to Gary and Vianora. Thanks, Marlene. Philanthropic, nonprofits, and other organizations that depend on charitable giving are now grappling with the reality of a dwindling revenue base. Many of these donors tend to be aging white baby boomers and their numbers are shrinking. 
As this base diminishes, some forward-thinking organizations have turned to other growing populations, such as Hispanics, to fill the gap left by the aging white donors. However, there is some concern that because many Hispanics tend toward more non-traditional donations, such as tithing to their church and remittances, they may not be as willing to donate to these larger organizations. I spoke with Ben Francisco Malbec, the former vice president of U.S. Programs for Hispanic Philanthropy, about these concerns and the approaching donor cliff. Ben, what is a demographic donor cliff and why are nonprofits so alarmed by this? Well, uh, the demographic donor cliff is this idea that, you know, the bulk of donors for many nonprofits are baby boomers. And that generation is getting older pretty quickly. Uh, and they are, you know, their giving capacity may be decreasing. And then, of course, as you get older, eventually you die. So, <laughs> you um, can't give that. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's no way can. to avoid it. <laughs> um, so, as that population sort of transitions and, uh, you know, fades away, uh, there's a concern that a new younger generation of donors uh, won't emerge to take their place. Um, you know, and it's connected with the growing. So this is a trend that's about the graying of the country and also about the browning of the country. Because as, uh, you know, our younger population is mostly made up of, of Latinos, African Americans, Asian Americans, other communities of color, um, there's a feeling like, will these folks give as well? Well, why is there such feeling? What lead people to conclude that these new uh, Americans won't give as, as, as much as the white baby boomers did? I think it's a, a mistaken feeling, personally, that uh, stems from uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is there are some studies that show that uh, Latinos, African Americans, give at a lower rate than uh, their white counterparts. Um, I don't, there are other studies, though, that have found different conclusions, that they don't give, uh, that Latinos and African Americans give just as much. Part of the reason for the difference is that uh, communities of color often may give differently. So we're more likely to give in more informal ways, uh, more likely to give to church, uh, which is, you know, a small donation every week into the basket. 10% um, of your uh, income. Exactly. <laughs> um, also, more likely to give to individuals. So Latino communities, for example, sp send as much as $50 billion in remittances to well, family, yeah, to friends, to their home to countries. Live. Exactly. So I would say that is an indication of a generous people. Um, so that's one reason uh, that some of the giving isn't necessarily captured in all studies and we give differently in communities of color. The other thing is that Latinos, African Americans have less wealth. So we currently make up, in terms of when you look at the dollars, mm -hmm. we make l up less of the total amount of giving. But when you look at the fact that for every dollar that a white family has, a Latino family has 10 cents and an African American family has 12 cents in wealth, the wealth gap, I mean, is enormous. So of course, if you have less wealth to give from, <laughs> the total amount of your giving will also be less. My hope is that, you know, with this graying and browning of America, that some of that wealth inequality will change. <laughs> you know, another, uh, I guess, challenge facing the nonprofit world is the impending tax laws. How would that affect uh, these nonprofit organizations? I think it's, it's hard to say because we don't know what the change is going to be. So there's a few different sort of possibilities on the table that could have different effects. Uh, you know, the most extreme one would be the elimination of the charitable deduction. So that if you give to charity, you could no longer deduct that from your taxes. That would be uh, just devastating. That would be, that would definitely have a, <laughs> I think, a negative effect. I don't think even that, I have to say, I don't think it would wipe out the nonprofit sector because people give for different reasons. You know, so people still give because they believe in it. They give because they feel a connection to an institution or an organization. Um, so even th I, that, I think, would survive, but would be vastly downsized in a, in a way that I think would be bad, not only for nonprofits, but for the economy. Um, then there are some other variations that might be less terrible, <laughs> like uh, you know, it, you know, President Obama uh, has hinted at uh, the possibility of maybe if you are extremely wealthy, you know, for the millionaires and billionaires, the one percenters. yeah, the one percenters, <laughs> there's a limit to how much you can deduct. Mm -hmm. You know, once you pass a certain threshold, and it's not. The truth is we haven't seen a lot of clear proposals for what this, there's been some intentional vagueness on all sides about what this would look like, partly because the charitable deduction is pretty popular. People like the idea that if you give something to a nonprofit organization, back. yeah, you, you, that, that's different from anything else you might do. 
So I, I'm hopeful that I don't think any of the worst proposals will happen. Um, but they could. So it, we need to be vigilant about that. There's a, a feeling in business in, in circles that the private sector mm -hmm. can better serve social service needs and interests. What do you come down on that? I think, well, one, I, th I think that trend has, is balanced by another trend. There, there's definitely a feeling among some, particularly Republicans, to be honest, you know, that, uh, that nonprofit, that, the, that basically private businesses are the best way to do most things. Um, so there's that idea that's out there. But there's also some healthy skepticism, I think. Part of the same trend is there's an increasing pressure on nonprofits to act more like businesses. Yes. You know, think, what's your bottom line? What are, you know, foundations saying to nonprofit? So we don't want to just fund you. We want clear outcomes. Uh, We're not going to give you a general operating grant. We're going to give you a grant to deliver for these deliverables. So there's this sort of corporatization of leadership. Uh, there's also corporatization of language. Um, oh, also, things I like think that. a lot of the executive directors and foundations come from the business side now, not from the social uh, justice world. And Absolutely. that's changing the focus. Yeah. Is definitely. this a trend that's likely to continue or will get back? based on the economic climate, because part of that reality is, is people don't have as much money to give and the economy is shrinking. Th that's and a great point. Every time there's a, a recession or there's trouble on Wall Street, there's a, an influx of corporate folks into philanthropy <laughs> in the nonprofit sector uh, who are you know, searching for different job opportunities. I think the trend will continue somewhat, but may subside as the economy gets better. Uh, and I think there are both good and bad aspects to it. You know, there, there certainly are, uh, I think there's a good thing about learning across sectors. I think efficiency is a good thing, and nonprofits, uh, you know, are, it's fine for nonprofits to think about efficiency, to think about deliverables and making sure we achieve our outcomes. On the other hand, there's a reason why nonprofits are nonprofits. Uh, you know, the whole idea of the sector is to accomplish those things. You know, it's there's this idea when, uh, when the private sector fails, when you have market failure, government needs to step in. Mm -hmm. And then when you have something even government can't do, when you have government failure, then nonprofit is sort of the third backup, mm -hmm. right? So if you have something like services for the most needy, uh, that's something that business does not generally do well. <laughs> and even government often, you know, unfortunately leaves out those who are mm -hmm. struggling the most, who are the most vulnerable. And I think that's where nonprofits, especially those that serve our immigrant communities, our communities of color, have a unique role that, that I'm skeptical that a business approach could really fulfill. Thank you very much, Ben Malbec, for this great conversation. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. When we come back, a Japanese independent film producer breaks barriers in the U.S. after leaving her homeland. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. My name is Fernanda. I'm the wife of a teacher. Budget cuts affected my husband's salary, so I'm picking up some part-time work. We're doing everything we can to make sure our kids eat today. Tomorrow, I just don't know. Fernanda, how'd I do? Well, I usually fold the underwear first. I meant the acting, but good to know. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Finally from us tonight, Hisame Kiroiwa is an independent film producer who came to New York during the economic crisis of the 1970s and unlocked a cultural treasure trove through her lens in the 80s. Amid the chaos of abandoned buildings, drugs, and high crime, Kiroi Wa encountered diverse communities with an exploding art scene unmatched by anything since. Judith Escalona filed this report. For nearly three decades, Hisami Kuroi Wa has been producing and distributing independent films, garnering awards at Cannes, Berlin, and Venice. She's worked with international and American filmmakers, among them Ang Lee, Spike Lee, Wayne Wang, and writer Paul Auster. People came to me and I just, you know, I didn't really look for the project, but the, you know, and also at that time, Japan had a kind of um, 
bubbling economy still. So they had a budget so I can finance, you know, the film. Kuroiwa was born in Japan and came to the U.S. in the 1970s through a study abroad program. She landed in Michigan, eventually finding her way to New York for graduate film studies at NYU. And it was kind of very eye-opening, you know, free, and um, it was kind of, you know, kind of a, still the feeling of the hippie movement, right? And um, I was feeling very sort of, you know, psychological free to explore, to reinvent my identity, to be, you know, in America, especially in New York. It was a fantastic city, you know? I used to live in the Bronx, like Fordham Road. I love the various places of the, you know, ethnicity, you know, mixture. I love the abandoned area and the people, you know. It was an amazing time. I was very lucky. In New York, Kuroiwa worked as a journalist and editor, writing feature stories about the art scene for Shuesha, a Japanese publisher similar to Condé Nast. I had a very interesting position um, to meet with anybody I want to, right? And my English wasn't so good enough. I was very shy, you know, in Japanese, and my mannerism being Japanese is very different from me speaking in English, that's what the people say. But I was kind of liberating, you know, to talk to the people in, under the circumstance. Kuroiwa met many artists, filmmakers, and writers who she eventually worked with, either producing or distributing their films. I happen to know, like, you know, Spike Lee and Howard Bruckner, Sarah Driver, Jim Jarmusch, and all those people in downtown New York. And I said, you know, I was watching the movie and said, oh, here's a budget, you know, I will you know, buy the rights to show it in Japan. So I, I took them to Japan for four weeks, you know, to travel together in different cities. Kuroiwa's latest documentary, The Space in Back of You, is an homage to the late Suzushi Hanayagi, an artist she strongly identifies with. Hanayagi was an accomplished kabuki dancer who came to the U.S. in the 1960s to experiment with modern dance. This is the year of the 50 years, you know, of the Judson Church dance movement to sort of, you know, absorb all those, you know, bursting energy of the, all the women's and men's and, you know, the ideas and experimentations and she grow, you know. The space in back of you shines a light on Suzushi Hanayagi's contributions to American contemporary dance and theater. The documentary also draws attention to the aesthetics and artistic practices the dancer brought with her from Japan. But I feel I respect like Noguchi or the Suzuki Hanayagi is because, you see, they don't care about their names and fame at the end of the day. Maybe they want it to be recognized, but they're kind of a catalyst. They influenced, they disappeared, they, they died, but they sort of left something that's in a sort of a stump of something in America, Japanese-ness. She was a red hot I'm Judith Escalona, Independent Sources. But many had a heart as big as a whale. Hidey, 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 hidey. Hidey, 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 hidey. Hidey, 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 The Space in Back of You will be playing at Anthology Film Archive. Also, a new feature, Kiroiwa produced Araf, somewhere in between, will be playing at the New York Film Festival on October 4th and 13th. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.